world. I think you should do an extreme close up as well, so that I don't do like thoughtful stuff. But I've got the presentation of the globe. It's always a presentation of the globe, so it's always a globe in the presentation. Right, I'll do all the quick stuff, boring stuff. Uh, blah, that's me. This is about that. You'll read it later. Um, I'll do quite a lot of stuff. Read that later. These are some of the companies I work for. So I'm not just some um, idiot off the streets who doesn't do anything. I'm the idiot off the streets, probably do something. <laughs> <laughs> no, too many jokes, I can't uh, Where are your colleagues? I do work through Sierra Peaks if you want me to do work. Or after I think you never want me to do work. I don't, I'm not associated with Sierra Peaks at all, this goes terribly. Nothing to do with it. Our giant's female. Uh, I like this because this is a, a positive thing. <coughs> not just saying, oh, the shipping board, we need engineering, oh, it's terrible, hammering, hammering, hammering. This is actually showing that the, the whitewashed history of uh, software engineering is actually based on females. And this lady here, she did the BBC uh, computer, which was an educational thing in the UK. Mm. Uh, she did the language, the language, which is cool, but what's cooler is that she did the risk language that everyone's got on their phone. So the arm risk is all based on that. So you're all carrying around a small pipe of a lady in engineering. Hurrah! Uh, so this is, we do lots of large complex projects. And we're essentially a, a software factory farm, we turn them out quick uh, and we have no tolerance for asking about, we do it all fixed price. So it's made us kind of leave and we have money up uh, And really this is how we play nice with Labview. So in this there will be no complex strategies, there will be no patterns, well I quite like that pattern, but there will be no design patterns. This is for my, my new book, Surreal Does with Design Patterns. Um, you can leave that here until I want to read that out. Please don't. So when you do lean and you're in factories, you say, oh let's do lean manufacturing, and then they always come up with the five S's, which makes perfect sense in Japanese. It makes very little sense when you try and find five things that begin with this. To match the Japanese version, but that's kind of it. Uh, and this is how it links. Uh, I thought, cool, this is a nice, nice little hook to hang my presentation on. I'll go for this. And then I remembered I had to do this when I worked in a factory, so I'm not going to do that. <laughs> Was that free jokes now? Yeah. <laughs> Going to the content. So, anyway, what, what this is really about is playing nice with Labby, because Labby is quite cool. And uh, in my presentation, come first, I am going to say why it's cool. But for now, just just assume this cool, graphical programming is cool. And these are some of the things. Now, this is just I sat down, brain dumped. These are some of the things I quite like about <laughs> And unfortunately, people make design decisions that take away some of these nice things that I like about Loki. So, for example, there's no free lunch. So, if you use references, it may not remove that, but it's going to make it significantly harder. I'm going to do a few here, so I'll rush through them. Again, if you want the details, put it to those. The bop, dynamic loading, can use a bit more. Boop, dynamic switch, can use a bit more. Reemptive, can use a bit more. Inline, can use a bit more. And there's other things that you use. And there's, the thing is, I'm not saying don't use them. I'm just saying be aware of the sacrifice you make. So I'll give an example. I picked up a system from quite a well-known company to rescue, opened it up, and he made everything re uh, And then everything that wasn't re-entered came in on a reference and was dynamically loaded. It was almost completely impossible for me to debug. So, that's the cost. So just, just be aware. So I'm going to talk about the clean code. And the way we, we try to work is simplest first, and then when we need something, we go all complex. Something more, more and simple is hard. <coughs> the 
you have to be an old kid like me to really appreciate that. Um, and essentially, you, you're right, I mean, you're getting angry like this all the time. But it's essentially, the, the point of the block diagram, computers don't care. They don't care if your block diagram is awful. You know, it's still going to run, it, it doesn't care. The only reason you do your block diagram in any fashion is for the person, you, and, uh, and the next person. So, the thing we have always said, and this is my constant argument with Mr. Nazinger, is that we program slow, and the reason we program slow is because I want to decode fast. Uh, because when you're designing a your system, you're sat in your comfy office, and that's cool. You can take your time, but when you're in front of your customer, you ain't got that time. And I hate sitting in front of my customer not being able to do the stuff they want. I hate it more than anything. I hate it more than 40% of things. So here's a lab view example, fresh from the lab view examples palette. And to my eye, there's a lot of stuff there that isn't actually telling me anything about the coding. What it's doing. So this is the only bits I'm going to sort of touch on. But to my eye, all the things I've marked in red are kind of, they don't have a lot of information. They're not telling me when I'm looking at it what the block diagram is trying to solve. Convey little information there. Rushing through, these are the only sort of four points for you, so, but I'll, I, will, I will show an example in a minute. So comments, the argument about comments is this. Um, my thoughts on comments are that they always stay on the moment you read and write them. The only thing in life that is honest in, uh, to do with software is the software itself. It's the only thing that's up to date. And this, this counts for documentation as well. <coughs> Source code is the best documentation. Ah, I'm not saying that you shouldn't do any uh, documentation, but source code is the best documentation. It's up to date. Um, and then you fall into these two camps. So if you need to document your code, the code is difficult to understand. That's a code smell. I quite like that. If you're, if you're writing what the code is doing, then that's a code smell. Um, all code needs to be fully documented. So quite often I get a job where it says, oh yes, we need, uh, we need a, a bloke off the street to come off the street and be able to maintain your system. You wouldn't want to do because you own a business. And this bloke off the street who's never seen land before is going to, he's going to be able to maintain my system because he's off the street and I've fully documented every movie he has to make. My 20 years of land view experience I've fully documented. And it's just stupid, you know, it's just a ridiculous thing to ask for, but I reckon once a year I get asked for it. I think I put in quite a fixed price of about two billion pounds. Well, I said, look, I'm continuously learning, you know? I'm going to have to be updated for the rest of my life. So this is a nice quote, and this kind of sums up how I feel about it, is... Uh, <coughs> People say, oh no, they don't do any documentation. And there seems to be pushback on self-documented code these days. But I like it. So we do a lot of what I would call self-documented code. I'll go through the list, let's go from A. I like bookmarks, they're cool. We colour code our icons, that's cool. I'll put in a really complex system once. And the thing they liked most about it was the color code of <laughs> Put in a really, <laughs> a really, really complex system in once. The thing they didn't like about it was I used Times New Roman in <laughs> one of the fonts. <laughs> the fighters didn't get built. The Times New Roman. Anyway, um, I like dropping stuff in, so we use new rate types all over the place. Uh, I like quite like dropping them down where I can get to them. Uh, I also like the little blue things that says as much as they're like things. So. You change this. You want to add a new received message? That's the place you go. Just right click it. I like that. 
D, I like labeling the true and the false. The positive on the true, which I flip that, if you flip that, it's actually green, that's even better. It's so angle. Um, but you look at it and it tells you the, um, the, true, the positive statement. Be positive. Uh, and by having to write it out, that clarifies your logic. Because if you're writing the true case, that, uh, the true statement is being, well, if I check this and this, all this and this, but not this and this, that's telling you a little story about that little green wire coming in there. That it's telling you not, you're not doing that easy design. Your logic is too complicated. Uh, D, E. We number our loops. Wow. It's good for telephone support. You ring up and say, look in loop A. Um, that's mostly what I saw. It's kind of useful. Uh, e, uh, what is it? I'll see it. Oh, there it is. Yeah, I quite like the shift register. I don't really use shift register so, so much anymore. But that's a lot. Yeah, G. So we don't use polymorphic VIs like people use, normal people use polymorphic VIs. I tend to use them as a, uh, as a message selector for an actor action engine. Or the other polymorphic action engine. But uh, that is actually just a command for every polymorphic instance. Um, which I quite like. Four loops. We do it whatever the iteration is. And that's quite handy as well. So there's a lot of documentation you can do, but you don't have to do it as it acts documentation. You know, you're using a new or whatever. It's quite handy. The other good thing about bookmarks is you can do your issue, issue tracking. So if you're all fairly cohesive in your design, you get an issue, you normally only put the issue in sort of one bit of code because you're cohesive. Like we're all cohesive to some extent. So we're not going to about 15 million places in the prison bus. So, so this, this works quite nicely. You can see here, I've just undone my, my argument, but issue 731, I've actually made updates. So I can actually look in my issue list and go, ah, oh, 731, I've made those updates, just made updates. Quite handy. It's all about being nice and tidy. Error handling. The way you're taught to do error handling is per sub VI, and if it doesn't work, then you pass it through. Blah, 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 blah. Um, I'm really much more interested in the state that generates the sub VI, or the queue that generates the, sub, uh, the error, or the event that generates the error. That's far more useful and interesting to me. So, what we do is we've got a little queue here. And we just capture all the errors and pass it to another loop down here and it fills them. It's really handy, it saves a lot of time. Well, I know James, but now he does something similar. <coughs> project design. Nobody really talks about project design. It's, it's like they have used dirty little secret. Um, but Again, this is, comes from sort of rescuing people's projects. It man, the projects are just an awful mess. And the problems that come from it. So this is what we do, and people are going to hate this, I'm sorry about this. I'll get to large, boring arguments about what we us using auto-populating bothers. And I'll get, so the argument against is, oh, I don't like using them because it's constantly telling me that something's changed. And then my, my response is, well, it should. I want to know that something's changed. I don't want stuff happening in the background not telling me it's changed. That's secrets. Secret software is shit. Um, what else do we do? We are uncompromising about dependencies. So, look in this little baby here. Again, every rescue project I come to, I look in that little baby there, and it's a horror show. Stuff. We always do it hierarchical, so we have a main call in the other, and everything else sits behind it. That view likes hierarchy, but it likes it a lot. Uh, so if you stick with it, we'll come into that. So I also like my main VI to tell me if the whole project is broken. So we sometimes hide any dynamic VIs. We don't use dynamic VIs extensively. We use them where they should be used, in our opinion. Um, but we always stuff them away in the block diagram. 
Because that way, if they're broken or something, or you want to search for the hierarchy or find all the callers, it's just from your main DI that they will call in DI. Oh, okay. So, go into dependencies, you get these. And this is, this is the process you go, find me the callers for those. Otherwise, it depends on you. Then find the callers. Now, usually, they're in there because they're old, they're just old code. But it's just... And one of your most productive days is removing code. I love, I love removing code from my projects. <laughs> it's great. I love Oh, a good couple of weeks deleting all the eyes from this project I worked on earlier in the year. And the way you do it is if you've dealt with the hierarchy, so there's no surprises, and you've got all your dynamic VIs coming from your main VI and everything's as it ought to be, you can use some of these tools there. And you can go, you can find me some items with no callers. That's really useful because if you've got everything linked correctly, there should only be one, which is your main caller. The main VI is the only thing that should turn up. So anything else is, is just a float in the eye that's not being used. That's just more confusing. It's more bloat, it's more stuff you have to carry around. <laughs> tidy, tidy, tidy. And this is the box you get when you go to that. It's, it, and it's, this box needs work. Anyone from NI yet? Ah! <laughs> Mate, work on that! <laughs> box is bloody awful. But it does kind of a job, I suppose. There seems to be an obsession with dialogue boxes on a lot of these. I don't see why they should. So I bring it up, and then if I actually want to then go to the project to delete the thing it's told me that I should delete, I can't because it's up. <laughs> Just. <laughs> Cross looping. So back in the days of. Matthew 4, we ran into the problem in pretty much one of the first few jobs that when I loaded my project, I put it outside the source pad control. It would randomly load files, PIs from other projects and whatever areas. And this was kind of invisible because it would just run the same as it ran last time. And it was a big problem. So what we did, and again the whole community at the time vilified us and said it was a bad thing to do, we just stuck all our projects in an ALB. <laughs> and that cured that problem. So, fixed Dennis Principles of Project Hygiene, which is a, I do, I read old books, old books that are worth reading sometimes. Uh, yeah, changes, anything you change in your code, so anything editable, in your source code, in any of your source code, you should be able to know that it's changed. Your source code control should tell you. So it's silent changes, they are evil. So what you get with crossing the kid if you don't know what I'm talking about. If any of these three projects share files, you can make a modification in the top one, and he's going to change, and he's going to change, and he's going to change. <coughs> So, here's an example. The FTP uh, set of VIs that comes standard with that hasn't got something that's really useful for people who are downloading and uploading FTP. <coughs> and that's a progress button. To say how, how long it's taking. And it's quite difficult to get to that. But it's not that difficult. But you, you go, I mean, essentially, we modified that, we chucked it at global, and then we moved it global. And that worked great until I then put it onto my repository and then showed it to my customer from his repository and his version of that. And of course, it didn't work so great because I'd modified it in the environment. So then, well, then you have to take it out of the environment, don't you? So this is the, the code that I, I re -wrote, re wrote just to demonstrate it. And the fix is, I'm, a, I'm afraid it's just brutal, is you take it out of the environment stick it in a library and stick it in your project. And it's, in fact, that's what you're going to do with NextGen in the, in the 
future, but based on a lot of this sort of feedback. So next year, if you use something reusable in, in, in the environment, you will put it in your project as a separate thing. Because everything here, pretty much you can edit. Which means that your, if you do a source code control, and you've got stuff in here, your source code is not under control. Because you can make any changes. And I've validated my project, so I've validated my customer. I've sat down, I've gone all through it, and done all my unit testing, I've done all my testing, and there's some brat could come in and change one of these VIs because they're editable, <laughs> and all that could change. But I wouldn't notice it from my source code control because it's in the environment. Be a bit careful about that, because it's, it's, it's more easy than you would think, because you're in a block diagram. So you just like, double click, open this wheel, this is not working quite right, and you don't know if it's in the environment or not. Yeah. It's easier than you would think to cause these issues. The other interesting thing for us, what we're doing on time, I'm probably rushing through this fairly fast. Right. I've got very old eyes. Who I am? Um, I'll slow down. So project portability. So this is quite important to us, and it's made an awful lot of difference to the way we work. So actually, I'll probably ought to give you some use cases here, and a lot of what I'm saying is is for our use case. So our use case is we get a lot of different projects in a lot of different domains. We don't know what we're going to get. Our reuse tends to be template-based and uh, design-based. It doesn't tend to, we don't manage reuse libraries, we don't share codes like that. It's just, it's just in that view, it's pointless and it's boring. Sharing libraries is boring. Not a librarian, I'm a software engineer. So, I can't remember what that slide's about. This is our standard sort of template. Um, and the idea behind it is, well, I should be able to take my NetView project, the whole project, and I should be able to take it from one directory and chuck it in another directory. They don't care. I should be able to upload it to our repository, and somebody with NetView should be able to download it to their repository. They don't care. No installs, no libraries, it's because it's part of the thing you want under control. So source code control should have all the dependencies. Data is free, you know, it's just free. A decent sized land view project is 60 meg, which is a song. <laughs> you know, it's, it's... And this is so important to us, it's part of our coding standards. So the initial check is open a blank virtual machine with that, you want to stick the project on, does it work? This is how important it is to us. And I'll give you an example of why this should be important. So, here's a case study. So I needed to do a Modbus uh, slate. I think it was. Uh, anyway, it was, uh, it was two, mod, two Modbuses uh, as instruments. Uh, using C React. And you download the kit and it sticks it in, I think it sticks it in VI. Interestingly, not instrument, but that's the one. So now you've got your installed Modbus uh, library. Well, I wanted to make a modification because I wanted uh, two, two of these things working on the same area, and the standard Modbus library doesn't let you do that. So I didn't make a modification, so I had to move it. It's easier, it's only Modbus, it's a library. What I need to do is whip the library out of beyond it or wherever and park it in my project. Talk to me. Oh, Christ. <laughs> Why would moving a Modbus library, which is a self-contained download, why from moving it from the area it should be to a new area cause me problems? And, right, so this is how I, you go for it. So the first thing you do is you throw away the bits you don't need. So I didn't need to do a master, I just need a bit like this. So, delete that. And that's 
Actually, that last comment is uh, it's a project, not an API. It's a lot of people get caught up with designing as APIs and toolkits. Uh, you can't get rid of the toolkit, you can't remove. I don't, didn't need it, I'm doing a project, I need to do it to completion, it needs to work. Um, so we're quite critical <coughs> about that as well, so chuck away stuff you don't need. But I'll go, I'll go very quickly because this, this could be a while, but essentially LabVIEW likes hierarchy and the reason it didn't like being moved was because the the main calling BI and the, all its sub BI's were on the same level. They didn't actually make it a hierarchy. Um, and doing that, and then going through 220 the eyes and okay, say, 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 say. They're cleaning it all up and sorting out the conflicts because there was a lot of waste in the, in the library as well. So this was a fun three hours, and all because I wanted to move the library from one directory to another. Oh, maybe not a hierarchy again. Okay. So essentially, the, the fix really was just to move it, make it hierarchical, make the main calling the eye, the sub the eyes, and then go through the noise. But once it's done that, put it in our project, we can move it around and place it. It's a huge freedom. And it's not just about being able to move it around, it's about ease of sort of version control and things like that. You're not you're not um, getting caught up doing that for three hours. Dependencies. Uh, I don't like dependencies. And as you get further into programming, you will spend more time managing dependencies. So I've had code given to me before where the uh, so I'm off an OpenG here. And that. Uh, cool, right, I'm going to slam off OpenG. <laughs> I'm going to slam off the way people work with reuse libraries. So this guy, he was a big OpenG fan. So what he would do, I'd go, oh, I want to do this. All that library. That whole library was a dependency, which had 15 dependencies. There you go. Right, I want to do that. Next thing, now the library. And that knackers my project portability up, because then I've got to load all the dependencies. And dependencies were pretty much things you can do in prims in, in seconds. You know, it wasn't the OpenG library for this particular thing, which was all the file hierarchy stuff. It wasn't the same for that much time, you know. It does it reasonably well. And to my mind, it, it, it showed this kind of thing, is that this is what I've become like with my driving now is that I'm so reliant on the, the tool telling me what to do. Now I've forgotten actually the technical details of navigating. Uh, <laughs> it really is like that, I'm afraid. I used to be brilliant at navigating, I used to be brilliant at spelling. And spell checking, sat and minced my mind. So Rob Pike, he's essentially the person who turned around all the Google servers. So this guy knows what he's talking about. And they ran this model. Uh, oh, I want to do this job, pull down a library. I want to do this job, pull down a library. And pretty much all the Google servers just went because <laughs> every little project had masses and masses and masses of dependency. I can't remember what it is now, but if you look at the LabVIEW dependency, um, the current <coughs> stuff, I'm not going to put it down. Over in 2019, you look at the dependency map for that, it looks very similar to that, which is why they're working on next year. Because that means difficult to manage. It's a the question of those only for presentations. And it's a bit like a globe. So presentations should have a globe in it. And and again going back to sort of crosslink here is how much of your editable code is under source code control. So everyone's taught that reuse is great. And the the pinnacle of reuse is that you know you only use 10% of uh, your own software and you reuse by picking the libraries off. And what that means essentially is, is that it's very difficult to keep your code under source code control because of all these dependencies. You know, so again, I think about it, I validated my complete project. 
and some library manager, you know, the user updates it and loads it into my system, or accidentally for another project loads it into my system. Then all that's changed. All that validation it will need doing all over again. And some of the projects we work on, that's, that's weeks of work. You know, and it's, I'm not saying everyone else's code is that, but it also shows a whole weakness in that, that model. Um, so again, this is what pushed us back to the project portability, is you push everything into the project, and then you can say, when I download it from my repository, I know exactly what it is. It's this validated version with this version number. Very important. I was talking to, I don't know, NI guys, about polymorphism. So the time of polymorphism, unique polymorphism, is when you've got the palette up, and you've just clicked on the polymorphic VI, and you're just dragging it across, and you plunk it onto your block diagram, it still needs to be polymorphic at that point, and then you wire the data type into the front of it. And then it's the particular type you want. From that point onwards, you don't need to be in polymorphic. Because you're very unlikely to say, oh, I've completely written my code with an array of strings, and now I'm going to use an array of bananas instead. So I want to automatically adapt to that. Well, it's, it's not going to happen, is it? Um, but what you do get with it is that. It's okay. I like what you do. But now I can't use the uh, hierarchy thing to navigate. It's just, it's just filled it up with stuff I don't care about. <laughs> and also, LandView carries this around with it. Like baggage. We'll get behind it. Big bag of extra rubbish. And part of the argument is, uh, is to do with extensibility. So you'll hear a lot of talk about sort of s'mores and things like that. Well, s'mores is, is only, I don't know, I'm going to have to find out what it is. Simple, modular, or <laughs> reusable, extensible, scalable. Don't know what the O stands for. Uh, does it work? Yeah. Now, you're taught that, and you're also taught a lot of your, your lab view design techniques by National Instruments. National Instruments makes toolkits and APIs. I don't make toolkits and APIs, I make projects. My requirement, my set of acronyms, is not smalls. What I want most of all is when I sit in front of my customer and he wants to chat me, I want to be able to make that change really quick. So I want flexibility, I want configurability. I don't need extensibility. If I've got a database in my system, I'm not going to need to extend it to two databases. It's just not. It's not that important. Um, so, the bodge we do, which personally I kind of think ought to be part of the IDE, is oh, wait a we just take we just take the instance most of the time and say it. The other thing is, is, is just ask yourself: Is there a primitive for it? Primitives come with with for free. You know, this this is the the OpenG library that you needed, and, and the and that library came with its dependencies. Pull it all in. Yeah, and, and this is safe, you know, when, okay. So I, I deal with a lot of customers that I have to go over a barbed wire fence to get to. And the internet doesn't follow me. And when I, <laughs> and, when I uh, and when I get there and I load my software, it goes, oh yeah, so there's my two libraries. Well, I then have to go walk across the site, which is half an hour, and then go home and go to where I have the internet download the libraries that are missing, and I'll go back in, and I'll load it again, and it says, ah, oh, I've forgotten this one library. <laughs> <laughs> just, just. And if it, it was purely because somebody wanted a matching green bloody icon, I'd be quite annoyed. <laughs> Show some code, so show a project. <coughs> so, I do a massive digitizer 
client server system. Uh, we call it Simple Shop. And you can have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of channels and lots and lots and lots of racks. And you can set all that up just a normal uh, service code. You can say that the entire screen is. It's a big old lump. It does all sorts. You can pick the images and build time targets. No idea. It does everything. And it takes me about a minute to build that to execute. Um, to real time deploy the uh, server, which is equivalently complex. <coughs> That's the reward you get for the effort you put into making the stuff legal. And I've talked to lab view engineers that are all of a fluster and missing their pain go out because of a minor change, it's costing them four hours to build their uh, Uber framework type app. And to my mind, and call me call me a, a grumpy old man, if an application takes two hours to build, there's something wrong. You know, not playing nicely with that. That just got the up for you, so I Just saying. This went a lot quicker than I thought it was, because I ran it on quick. Um, so on Thursday, I'm doing a sort of psychological work, which is much more on my street, really, but it's practical stuff. Um, Nationalism was a good and a funny name. But it's essentially, it's about um, dealing with the idea and the psychology of such. If you want to hear me talk about state machines, then uh, come to Team DevCon in August. Come out to the UK to learn great curry. It's a curry centre of the world, 40% of the world. You can get naan bread, it's called the table naan. So it's good information. Blah, 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 take a survey. I won't read it, so it's so okay. <laughs> Ooh, sorry, that's interesting. That's the best slide so far. Uh, yeah. So, any questions? If, if you've got an extra time, I love the features and how different, like Goop and everything, limited those features. And it, I don't think yeah. I'm the only one, but if anybody else, I'd like to hear you go into that in more detail. It is really, I mean, and it doesn't. I put a big cross for it, and as I was doing it, I think sometimes it's not actually a big cross, and sometimes you can just make life a little bit more hard. So for me, I find the editing in the project is a bit pain in the ass. So, and, and certainly the, the, the way LVU does it currently is very much in the project. So that instantly makes my navigation worse. The, the, lay, the natural layering of a lot of the users that also makes the navigation worse. So it's a bit slower. We use it though. I mean, we, we, we tend to pick the areas that it's best at. I think for hardware extraction, as it's Brilliant. I don't know a more elegant way that you can you can do hardware traction players than that. So, but and then we can only wrap them up and ruin it by making everything too much. Can you show me a slide with your boots? On the what? Somewhere in the beginning and you can show just slides with the boots. The book, I'll be. Say when. I'll tell you what. Oh. scared everyone by walking out and there's progress. <laughs> um, process smells was my thing I did. A, so there's videos for these everywhere. So there's a thing I did at this, uh, but essentially it's, it's uh, it was a discussion on how, how, how customers can cock up their projects. Um, essentially, it's, I mean, I was going through the different types of customers and the different types of risks associated with those customers. Uh, you know, I've, been, I've, done, I've done probably 200 to 300 Latvian projects for, in every area. You know, we, we, don't, we deliberately don't concentrate on an area. So I tend to know, or I, I, I kind of like the anthropology of companies. I find company anthropology is very interesting. There's certain company, I mean, there was one story I told in the process now. We, we walked into a company, or we drove into a company, we went to this meeting, we were in this meeting, we had loads of people 
And the managing director came in and interrupted the meeting, and he, he wanted us to go and go and park our car to the company standards because <laughs> we parked it front end, and he wanted it to reverse it. And after 27, <laughs> um, so we're uh, last. No, a few years back, okay. well, three years back now, we did ISO 9000. Um, risk and mitigation was, was an interesting one, I thought. Because um, I, I see people going into projects, certainly software engineers, and you don't want to declare the risk or mitigate against it. You know, you go, I'm going to use this because it's interesting. <laughs> and, and you don't sort of sit down and go, well, you know, so. I think a fairly good example. Does anyone work in universities here? <laughs> cool. So the universities are, for a software engineer, a peculiar challenge. One, if you've got four professors and you want a piece of software, then each one will have very strong ideas about how the software should work. Two, they know they can get a grant to work for free. So if you charge anything more than free, they're going to be with you. Always interesting, they're nice places to work. But the, 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 these, these were the things, there's, there's risk and mitigation. So you know, when you go into a, like a job for a university, you have to sort of really emphasize the value you're bringing over what a grant can bring. So, uh, what else? So yeah, the, the simple software process thing we did a couple of years ago, um, and that was just essentially sort of going through our, our process, because we're ISO 9000, we've automated a lot of uh, the way we do software. So I went through that, I think it's all videoed. Um, and then I got fed up with people telling me that their, their uh, techniques were modular. Um, so I actually went for it and, and, and told them what happened in cohesion meant and all the different types. <coughs> yeah. Uh, what's your opinion on the kind of philosophy and roadmap that I feel like you know, is pushing with lab development because, I mean, I, in summary, I agree with a lot of the things that have gone through here, and the fact that, it's my understanding talking to people that have gone through the examination certification classes, which I have talked about, is they really push for heavy documentation in those exams and stuff like that, where I agree with you in the fact that your code should be almost as so my, I, 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 this, the thing I've sort of cottoned on to in the last few days that I'm talking about is that um, we're all supposed to be scientists and engineers, and yet when we're given a way of doing software, we're like, all right, <laughs> and just go and do it. And surely the scientific and engineering method should be applied to all the techniques that you're doing. I mean, I, we're brutal, like I say, over 20 years. If somebody comes to us and says, Oh, these are the, these are the shiny new emperor's new clothes that you should be wearing. We put them on, and if they're not comfortable, we just have to not do it. Because for us, it's got to make our lives easier. It's got to make me less stressed. It's got to make my customers happy in some fashion. You know, there's, and it's got to either cost me less to do or give me more options. There's, there's quite a very you know, it's a finite list of desirable things from new methods that, and these new methods aren't new. That's the other thing, so, I mean, oh, you're so old-fashioned, you don't use LVU. Oh, that 1968 brand new bloody technology that came out two years after I was born. Um, and it's, I think mean, Actors came out in 72, that, that was, that was, you know, this stuff is really old. And for this computer science, is crap. It just is crap. There's little, there's nothing on graphical programming at all because universities will not research it because it's not free, and you can't make a graphical program for free, not a decent model. And they don't, they can't analyze big complex projects because they're big and complex, and you can't fit that into a curriculum. So you only learn how to do big complex projects by doing big complex projects. <laughs> and so we're all self-taught. There's pretty much from the 70s and the 80s, there's some brilliant writing. Brilliant writing on design and stuff, and very little that's really grabbed me recently. I mean, I'm not a big fan of solid principles, I think it's a very complex way to describe something simple. 
button on the bits. If the thing I don't build on, because I go pure data flow, a lot of these sort of loops up, the solid principles makes a lot of sense for I, I, I don't buy into it because it doesn't make much sense. So I think if you're, if you're a room full of people that are successfully programmed loop, solid makes a lot of difference. Um, but yeah, I, I read them and you take out the bits that are interesting to you. And, and I think that's what everyone should do, you know. Um, rambling, I missed, missed the question. <laughs> the, the thing that I've come to the conclusion sort of a year ago was, was what I, I said earlier, is that the bias within National Instruments, all the really good software engineers for National Instruments, the influential ones, have spent their life making toolkits. And APIs in the big for a big single monolith of software. They don't speak to my requirements very much because, like I say, I, I, I'm in a I'm in a software factory that I'm when I'm churning out projects. You know, I'll get a customer come up and they give me 50% of the requirements, expect me to give them a fixed price, uh, and then you know, and it's usually get it because it's you know it's, it's two weeks from the time it should be it should be delivered or. You know, what do you need a pass that? <laughs> um, and, you know, all of that kind of stuff is, is where we work. And, you know, and then you get on top of that, that view is easy. Programming is optional. And all of that chips away at people's sort of expectations. And actually, it's not easy. And doing it simply isn't easy. Making it, you see, you know, I spent four hours move, trying to move a library out of the idea. That's how much effort I put in to make it what I want it to be. I, I've spent three months unpaid this year taking a, uh, a contractor software and making it the thing it needed to be because it's for a university. I knew full well when I chipped up with the visa version that all the, all the profs are going to have the eye going, let's change this, let's change that, let's change this, let's change that. And, and I knew full well that with the architecture that I was given, it would work. You, you just wouldn't be able to change anything because it was broke. The other nuance I would add is it's, it's particular to your use case. So I could be talking this stuff that's my use case. But if you work in a, work in a factory like Tom there, and he's, he's responsible for a big machine that a lot of people are pushing software into, you would, we would need to modify a lot of our things that are important. You know, so you know you probably want to be using sort of um, Sub modules in sort of version control and you know more high level sort of um, actual architectural management, which which we don't generally need to do because there's only two two to four of us in the company. We all work exactly the same way, but because we're fairly rapid, the times when two people are working on the same bit of code, it doesn't happen that often. I mean, I would dispute the times when people should be working on the same bit of code in, in, their, in their architecture is wrong anyway. But um, that's another, probably another discussion. Um, is that, that kind of uh, answer about five questions for your one then? <laughs> <laughs> never ask me a question. <laughs> Anyone? So what is your social control system? We just use subversion. Mm. See, the thing for us was... We used a bought uh, public one for a while, and you know, again, you're recommended to do this. But what that becomes is a target. So this thing, this this I think it was code space, as it was called, and it had everything. It had wikis against the software, and had all your bug reporting for you. Did pretty really good. Unfortunately, like, when they got up to about three terabytes of customers, the big customers' data, they became a target for hackers. Uh, one morning, the owner of the, the code spaces came in, and there was a e hotmail addressed email that says, "We bought your passwords. Pay us however much, or we delete everything." And uh, they delete everything because <laughs> they didn't pay it because there's only seven of them. They could have bought the, the ransom. Uh, so we we do it all ourselves now. So we have our whole host our own repositories and keep them away. <coughs> we make sure that those repositories, you know, that we we put in. Code. I'll show you actually. We put in code that essentially zips it up and it brings it back because that was the thing is is when you when you offload all your repositories to the cloud, somebody else owns that. 
and it's not, and it looks after it's not you. And really, you need to be able to sort of pull back a, a backup of those repositories. And, and nothing complex, just pull it back as a zip file and then you can rebuild it and just rebuild it. So that, that was the lessons learned from that one. And again, you're told to do lots of complex things, but actually, if you break it down to what your requirements were, it was, I, I want to be able to, I want to be able to drag my code in from any computer. I want to, I want to undo if something corrupts. You can't go digging back loads and loads and loads of versions. You know, it just doesn't work because you're progressing through a project. You want to be able to maintain, you want to be able to keep on the record of uh, bug fixes and updates. Um, and that's, that's just stuff you need to handle from your, your version control. A lot of the other stuff, that needs so much work. And people think, and they, they say, oh, yes, you know, so that's because it's lab view, you, know, you can't use version control properly in lab view. If you ever work in an embedded system with those C programs, you can see how well the, the, uh, the thing works. It doesn't work at all well. You they spend hours arguing with each other about who broke the build. Um, and essentially, a lot of that sort of just comes down to the management. So yeah, for us, we may move to Mercurial, but I know SDN, I know all the hooks, I can make it do everything I want. I can, I can, each repository, I can add an individual login so customers can have access to it. And it's all just a couple of like Linux text files, you know, so that's, that's I've got maybe tools that do that for me. Yeah, but I've wrote so much. None of that is actually very hard. Okay, yeah, I, I probably should have spent a bit more time on it. Whereas when I, when I went through the slide, I got ah, I was, uh, people, people will make their own things that are important to them. But the actual point I was making is every time you use a technique where it's not needed, you're sacrificing the things that impact you that good. So for me, the only reason I use lab is because it's really good for debugging. And my brain works with a debugging brain. I program by debugging and work by debugging. Set rules for my design, but once I've done those sort of set structured things, I'm away debugging. You know, I, I never know how, I'll get a classic example, you know, which, whether it's rows or columns to go into a four next loop of this, I never know that. I just point it, look at it, and do it. And that's the beauty of that, you can't do that no more. It's not, not easy to do. You know, looking, testing, this is coming into my third thing, but testing what the software is doing compared to trying to work out what the software is doing. If you've ever programmed in Visual Basic, so Visual Basic is, you drop something down, so I want to do, I want to open a database, okay? Google opening a database in Visual Basic, cut and paste, <laughs> opening, and then, oh, actually, you, know, you go through the, the, the 15 pages of arguments about which is the best way to open a database in Visual Basic, and then and cut and paste one of them in it. And that's it. You never remember, you don't really understand how it works. Um, I find that you understand how it all kind of goes together and works. I never really got a grip with it all completely. Um, so, yeah, the things for me that are important are to be able to experiment. So, that's why I was talking about experiment. I, I don't, I want to be interactive with my source code. Um, so, if you have a a framework or an architecture where nothing runs, then if you can't get to an individual VI and run it, that makes life a little bit more difficult for you. Um, you know, if you've got to load an entire framework and get it to run just to run the VI, you're looking at it's like a lot of extra shit you have to deal with that you don't need to do. It. So it's very important for us to sort of have in our code the bits that run separated from the bits that are uh, not running. So things like, you know, if you needed to generate a cube to make something run, and it goes into an algorithm, and the algorithm should be a VI just for data. Because you are getting the benefit from that. And if you make everything re you know, that, that for example, is, is going, you're going, it's going to make several things more difficult. It's not going to, it's not going to remove them, but it's going to make them more difficult. And then the, the key, really, is when they're combined. Uh, if, if you've got 
several small things that take away several advantages and you combine them into one sort of architecture, you're just going to lose everything. You might as well, you might as well write in C++ for the piece of the class. You don't, don't write in that view. You don't, you don't want any of the advantages of the idea. Use a different language. And I'm not saying we don't use any of these. So don't don't take this as as me saying that these are bad things. What these are is tools to do a job. And when you take a particular tool off the list, it's going to affect something. That you're, going to, you're going to make a sacrifice. So there's no free lunch. Is the point. So yeah, so references are a good one. So there, the link between the front panel and the block diagram. One of the key aspects of, of uh, that what makes Lambda easy is that uh, that number's the wrong number. Right click. Oh, that's where it's generated. That's the simplest uh, step you make from the visible manifestation of the thing you're looking at to the actual code that's generated. You make that harder. You're, you're just removing useful bits of your brain that would be used for solving problems. <coughs> um, so we were reference. And the common architecture I find is, and again, sorry if I think this is only your reference, but is people take all of their, all the uh, controls and indicators and they make a reference and then they put that reference into a big, uh, big array. They probably, because they're told that the uh, class is made things modular, they then put that into a class called God Reference Class or something. And then if you're looking shop type, I've seen this. Uh, the gold reference class is it's not just got those references, it's got key references, it's got everything else. And, uh, and the complaint you'll see on the forum is, well, every time I load my project, I get a, a little dot on my, my project window because it's saying it's trying to save stuff. And it takes an age to build. And it's an, it's, yeah, there are, there's, there's computer design reasons why that's a bad thing to do. References are a uh, form of cohesion. Not form of uh, And if you use a lot of them, what you're doing is losing the link between the actual data and the thing that's happening to so you're making that navigation harder. So that's why that come up with sort of searching and things like that. So functional sub VIs again the most the most dumb simple VI you can possibly get is data in does something to it data out so you don't have to initialize it you just change the numbers of the input and get the input and get all the as well so a functional sub VI is is probably the most useful thing it's, it's where Lambda really shines it's where you haven't got anything fancy it's just changing one set of strings to another set of strings. So again, there are times you have to use dynamic loading. You want to pop up graph, for example. Yeah, well, you can do it, really. You want a TCP listener. That's really done dynamically. You know, you can't, you can't really do it efficiently without it. But when you do it, there's other, there's other things you, you have to put in place. So, for example, if it's going into a sub panel, you can actually right click on the sub panel and go show me the bot diagram, which is nice. Really useful. Um, so you know, there's, there's things you can actually do to help yourself. But generically, they, they cause issues. Um, so again, we use them, but only really strictly where I, I need to use them. So a system with all the re-entering VIs also uses subpanels and references, and it would build itself into the program at the end. You know, so the actual the actual VIs you were looking at when the thing wasn't running was very much different than the thing that was running. And surprise, surprise, it was quite difficult to work with. Similar. Um, that's just a lot of the, the LVU stuff was, was to do with data abstraction. Really. Sometimes data abstraction is really useful. 
sometimes people will, I don't know, if the, if the end point is a string, you don't need to later abstract a string, it's a string, you know, it's just, well, it's just, you're just adding extra uh, stuff to a lead over to that kind of thing. Inlining, again, you, you'll get all sorts of issues with that because the, um, from a performance perspective, you, you just this, this is one of the, the things that you're, you're you're picking from the toolbox when you when you when you program to share essentially because it's not working, it's not going fast enough. So now I've got to start using some of these things. There is a, but again, it's a manual VI is really, 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 really useful if you're making toolkits. Manual VI is for me, I can't remember what it is. It's just, I like, I like using the tools that have them. So I'm not saying people should do it, but for my internal projects, that's, that's too deep a, a, a dull for it. To think of the occasion where I would need to. But the point of the exercise is you wouldn't just use them everywhere because of the cost. So you use them where they need to be used to minimize the cost. Wait, I heard you say earlier that you're not using shift register. So my colleague Adrian likes shift registers uh, in, a, in a while loop to hold memory, which is what we always used to do. But then the, uh, what they call it now, I might never call anything by the proper name. The thing that replaced shift registers. Big moment, that's the key. That came in, and that's actually what it's for. So one of the things that I always think is that you should use the right tool for the job. So it's specifically designed for that. To me, using a while loop that goes around once is stupid. So, yeah, yeah. so you're, you're using that just to hang a shift register on. So if you, you put something on there. And my, I thought my colleague was here, he'd, he'd, he'd be on your side. <laughs> so, but personally, I, I, I think one of the sort of, one of the key aspects of simplicity is you, you use a thing for what it should be used for. You know, and, and, you know, when, you, when you're looking at a piece of code from somebody else, you go, what the hell did he do that for? And that really, especially at the top level, you're then going all the way through. Every design decision that he makes from that point on, you're going, oh, he's, he's the guy who did this weird thing. <laughs> and the other thing is, from an NI point of view, so if you use events, for example, for passing data, which they do very well, and I was under no obligation to make passing data and it's any more efficient than it is. Whereas if you use passing data, NI is, is that's what they're for. So NI is kind of wants to make them faster because that's the tool for the job. Yeah. You know, and again I'll have arguments with the code about this. Because <laughs> he is he loves the strict typing of, of using events to pass data. So I just sort of say, well it's not what it's for. It's for events. Any other questions? Yeah, well, could you get back to your plan? Sure. I was thinking it's actually. You're secondary, isn't it? No, 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 no. Where was that? Do you know why I hated it much? Because I went on holiday. I've been working on this test system for years in my own time. And it would have, it would have radically changed the thing I did with the rare place. The speed code test for airflow centers. I came back from holiday and I five S my area and chuck my test system out. <laughs> that was the most I've ever. What I tried to do is bag the different areas and I tried to make the, the, the presentation so you could fix it. So if you wanted to, to use the lean aspect of it, I tried to I tried to make it kind of useful for that. Uh, so that's a big manufacturing organisation. Okay. That's all part of a lean manufacturing as well. 
it does fit in quite nicely. It's just, I still can't um, forgive them for throwing away my test. It was really good. I hand wired the damn thing. It was brilliant. Everything out of the way. I thought it was a great idea. 
I don't know, as I've got older, I've got, we, we used to be very, very good at making those over the uh, Even now, we, we don't use it independently. So, uh, in my digital side of thing, I have to sort of pass and, and chuck data into lots of graphs. Yeah, if, they get, if, they, if they pop out 15 graphs and uh, they want to see the data on those 15 graphs, well, by definition, that's where the data. However, whatever mechanism you use to get it onto those graphs, and it just so happens that if you want it quick, verbals are really quick. If you wrap them in a VI, they they Thank you. 